Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Tonight, we're... Oh, that's kind of cool. There's like an echo. Okay, there. we're going to cover joint pain causes and solutions. And you can see how we're laying out the, the first few months of this year. We're going anatomy, physiology, and neurology because we are opening up a teaching site. And this teaching site is going to te teach everybody from um, super qualified anatomists, physiologists, neurologists, okay, to moms, dads kids so they can learn how their body works. So this is part of that. Now the censored portion is going to be on what science is, like how you question science. Yes, I know, question science. I know there's supposed to be a Fauci light, uh, lightning storm on me now. No, but you're going to learn the difference between science and the science. Now these are, it, it's just I had to show you the, the number of videos that have been banned, but the frustrating part is I like what, if you're ever on like like um, YouTube and you're looking at like history, I like history, I like sailing, and I like off the grid stuff. So I like things building, you know, people building. It. I was watching a History Channel guy, and he says, "Look, we're being deleted." The History Channel guy, because there's a lot of stuff that you can't say in history that's actually true. That because history, you might say, "Well, man has been here ten thousand years," then you say, "Man has been here a hundred thousand years." then there's some evidence of man being here a million years, but you can't say that. So he's being deleted. Off the grid guys are being deleted. Okay, the, the Ice Age farmer has, has been censored, okay, and then came back a couple of times. Just know, know that some of these videos have been on 2012, 2015, so they've been up for 10 years. But now the information is not appropriate for you. Okay, so. Thank you for the Dr. B VIP for all those that are, that are helping support that. Honest to goodness, this is fantastic. The most important thing about the Dr. B VIP, though, is to share the information because this is um, really draconian world we're living in. And Extreme Health Academy, extremely important to help these people. I'm on there at least once a month answering questions, doing webinars, but pe real people, real problems, real solutions. And that's a heck of a group. So we're going to look at muscles. When, when you look at, there's three different types of muscles, okay? Skeletal muscles. Now, these are actin, myosin filaments. And when they're getting closer, the muscle has more strength. So when you're using skeletal muscles to work out, I recommend, because nobody in nature has the arm stretched, so there's very little contact on the actin, myosin filaments. What you do is you shorten the muscles, get underneath something, and then you can lift a great weight. So why don't you do the same thing at the, at the um, gym? Don't extend your arm all the way. So what we recommend when we talk about muscles and exercise, if you're going to do curls, you curl it up from here up to here. Now there's muscle contractions called concentric where that muscle shortening. Those are excellent, but eccentric contractions where the muscle is under a force load and lengthening are amazingly important. So now let's say we want to work our brain. So you're going to start with the muscle partially contracted and you're going to go up with one side and down the other and breathe like it's Lamaze class because those, those muscles burn oxygen. Smooth muscles, these guys nearly never get tired. Okay, you're looking at lungs, gastrointestinal tract, everything. They're amazing. Now, if you have cramping because your intestinal tract are working really good, putting moist heat on both of these types of muscles really, really help. Cardiac muscle is the coolest muscle in the world. It starts when you're inside a mom. It doesn't stop for the next 120 years. Okay, it's amazing. There's a studies, and you could look at our Digestive videos, you can look at our, our exercise videos, you can look at our cardiac and heart health videos for more uh, ideas on there, but know that cardiac muscle actually renews itself. And they know that because of radioactive exposure back in the 50s when we were exposing people to bombs just to see if they would die fast or slow or you know to, to toughen our soldiers up. 
Well, they found radioactive particles in the heart that actually um, left. Okay, so the heart, even the heart muscle can renew. It's amazing. Now, when we're talking joints, joints are basically two bones coming together surrounded by a joint capsule. And there's everything, finger joints, wrist joints, everything. And that capsule is filled with a synovial fluid or a super filtrate of blood. So, yeah, doesn't that mean that blood has to be healthy in order to get the synovial fluid in there? Yeah, so all joints are hydraulic. So every joint in your body needs blood supply, but it also needs nerve supply. Because you're going to have muscles or tendons crossing those joints, and you need a healthy nerve supply. And there's things called dermatomes, which is an area of skin supplied by a specific nerve root. Myotome, which is muscles supplied by a specific nerve root. And sclerotomes, or bone, which is supplied by a specific nerve root. So those, and bone is alive, it's living tissue. And cartilage is alive, it's living tissue. And you can regenerate cartilage. But know also, the dermatomal pattern, or the, the nerve pattern on the skin, is very clear. It's, it varies a little bit with, with, with some people. Like C6 generally covers these two. C6 and some people will cover half of the middle finger. C6 sometimes covers just the thumb, but you know, it's gonna be generally that area. So if someone says, man, this hurts right up to this little pinky, and they'll even run their hand along it, that's C8 dermatome. I can fix that one pretty darn quick. Okay, so, so you know, people will tell you where it is. Now, forward head carriage, posture is huge. When you're looking at the neck, brachial plexus, and let's just look at the shoulder for a second. You've got one bony attachment called the clavicle. You've got 18 muscles that guide this shoulder around. So the shoulder is going up and down the rib cage area. It's amazing. And all the nerves that supply it come out of here. So if you start to round your shoulders over, and the body rounds over those shoulders in order to open up the holes. They're called the intervertebral foramens in the back to take the pressure off. When you figure right up here at the top, okay, of the thoracic area, those are the sympathetic nerves applied to the heart. So if somebody has a problem with the neck, loss of curve, they're going to have a hyperkyphosis or a rounding over. So this is why we do a posture analysis on everyone. And because if you have your head forward, you're literally choking off the blood supply and nerve supply to the shoulder. Plus, if your body is rounding over, remember, one bony attachment for this whole upper extremity, 18 muscles hold it on the rib cage. So if that rib cage is distorted and the shoulder's got to move everywhere, you're going to have some altered mechanics. Does that make sense? Well, let's look at 2005. Subacromial impingement, the role of posture and muscle imbalance. Um, literature suggests that postural deviations with forward head posture follow distinct patterns of increased kyphosis, downwardly rotated anterior protracted scapula, which leads to compression of the anterior. No, this couldn't possibly do that. So when I see patients, okay, literally patients, they say, yeah, you know, I'm going to physical therapy and it really hurts, helps my shoulder a little, but it just won't go away. Dude, okay, let's fix the problem, okay? Did they look at the neck? No, they didn't. So you have to realize that posture is super important when you're talking about upper extremity and even lower extremity. Now, you've got a scapula, and you've got, this, this is what, what this humerus bone attaches to. Now, it sits in this socket. Now, you've got four muscles that hold this humerus into that socket. Now, if any of those muscles get weak, now, when we're talking about weak muscles, does that mean you're not using it? Or you might have forward head carriage compromising the blood supply and nerve supply. The top muscle that's the most vulnerable is called supraspinatus. Okay, and, and this does the first 15 degrees of motion. And so I get people all the time. I still have never seen a totally torn one, even though people come in and they say, well, yeah, it was totally torn. The doctor said, you know, it's, it's just completely messed up. And I'll say, well, it's not messed up completely. And those, what do you mean? Well, it works the first 15 degrees. So if it's completely torn, the person will have to move like this and get their arm up. So the deltoid can take over. So, and, and what you're gonna see is, is 
the surgeon is getting their information from MRIs, which inflammation distorts the picture. And also laying down distorts the image as well. So, so they're working in the wrong place instead of looking at what that muscle actually does. But the key is that bone, that humerus, is held in socket by the rotators. Now, if any of the muscles get weak, it doesn't fall out of the socket. It falls up because there's a massive deltoid on top. Oh yeah, so when we look at this, here's a gal with a fake shoulder and shoulder replacements. Man, if you can avoid them, please avoid them. And we have a number of people. It, it's interesting, bomb experts in the, in the military have horrible shoulders. I don't know, you know what, what they do or if they're wearing the suit or what, what the mechanics are. I'd love to go down to Camp Pendleton and, and see their biomechanics, maybe give us some advice. But a mechanical shoulder like this is horrible. But remember, 18 muscles hold that shoulder to the girdle. Do you see the spine perfectly straight there? Or is the spine bent off at an angle? Okay, you can imagine the neck also is showing loss of curve and forward head carriage. So we know that this shoulder has had compromised nerve supply and biomechanics for decades, because you're looking at over 10, 15 years of damage on that neck alone. Why, why don't they look at this? So here we go. Posture in patients with shoulder overuse injuries in healthy individuals. There is no such thing as an overuse injury. Okay, right now, you know there's a, there's a hundred doctors going, oh, blasphemer, oh my God. Okay, can someone do the same job and not get the injury? Yes or yes? Yeah, of course. Okay, so if you have you know, you're running a checker, okay, and you're checking in things, and you have a compromised nerve supply, yeah, you're altering, you're having your body do a normal action with compromised blood supply and nerve supply to that area, okay? So the same person, or the, the similar job, same job, different person doing that job all day long, they don't have the issue. This person will, this person won't. So you have to look at the mechanics. So your body is designed to do repetitive motions. Now, um, the Mayo Clinic. Yeah, see the jar of the Mayo up there? That's like, like I, think, I think it was police squad or something. Okay, just fun. Shoulder impingement and pain. A forward hunch posture can cause these tendons to become pinched eventually that can lead to a tear, rotator cuff, serious injury. Fantastic. So again, people are finally looking up that the body posture and things are involved in shoulder injuries. Plus uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, rotator cuff injuries, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, all of these things are listed in some literature, some because not everybody is in agreement. This is how science actually works. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's the old days. Okay, pre-2020. Um, but they're called double crush injuries. Begin the impingement here, causing a symptom there. 57% uh, of all large rotator cuff repairs fail. Why? Okay, when we look at this, previous research shows between 20 and 90% of rotator cuff repairs re-tear. Are they fixing the neck? No. Are they fixing the biomechanics of the rib cage? No. Okay, so you got to look at the overall thing. So when you're looking at this, this is what the American Journal of Orthopedics says, cervical spine pathology and radiculopathy. They're not correcting it. These are the reasons that it fails but they're not doing a thorough assessment or correction of the cervical spine because they're not taught it. These doctors are really, really smart, kind of. Okay, they're educated by a pharmaceutical industry that understands drugs and surgery. They don't understand creating inflammation with a force loading using your hands, okay, and, and doing pre and post x-rays to document how you regenerate it. Uh, subscapular neuropathy, again, this is coming from an altered biomechanics underneath that scapula in the thoracic area and the neck area. Um, it, you know, it, it's just so simple. Now, your biceps, biceps means two. One of the heads, the long head, actually attaches to the top of this socket. It's called a labrum. And so a lot of times you're going to get some tears there. But understand the labrum is alive. It's living tissue. So I just had a patient today. Oh yeah, I tore every ligament in my shoulder. I hit it and it, his, he described an injury that that guy's lucky to be alive. 
Okay, so absolutely. But this was 30 years ago. And, and if you've ever seen a grade four separation of the clavicle, it's, it's like he's got a military thing up here. Okay, he only had grade two, so I know that it wasn't a complete tear of this, this ligament that holds the clavicle on the whole shoulder thingy. Um, but if you have a torn labrum, it's living tissue. You have to correct the problem. What was the problem? Oh, restore the biomechanics, okay? And you have to drop that shoulder back in place to reform the labrum. That's the key. That's what's missing. And the deltoid is super strong. That's why you have this, this superior dislocation. So what you're going to see is people that stand like this, if they have a shoulder injury holding a weight, it actually feels better. Okay, because you're dropping it down into that socket. And when you go like this, that's when it hurts. Okay, right now there's about four people that screamed on the internet. Oh, go to see, you know. Okay, so when you look at this, this is how you do it. You have to put your palms forward, chin up, a weight big enough to open it up. But I would definitely recommend looking at the neck first, doing a neck exercise. Because I tell people you can do this exercise fantastic. You know, get adjusted, do the neck curve exercise, and we're going to go over how to do that. And then put a weight in there so you could drop it. And then you just want a pendulum. One up, one down, and this is going to start to reform that labor. It works really, really good. And literally five to 20 pounds. Now, the worst thing you can do is to go through the full range of motion. So you got a, the bone here, humerus, in a socket that's not in the socket. It's up high, down low, whatever. And so what do they do? They force you to walk up a wall to get full range of motion. And they, they measure you each time and they say, wow, you got 20 degrees more. Oh, wow, great, great. Okay, and then when you look at it, and you can see there's literally, it's superior displaced. And you, you're doing all of these exercises with the distorted labrum. So we recommend not to do that until you have the labrum full. So you're going to be doing this exercise for at least a couple of weeks, depending on how much damage was done. My son at the time here was a semi-pro paintball player. This is actually what a shoulder dislocation looks like on x-ray. Now, I've set a whole bunch of dislocated shoulders. This one I took an x-ray of because it was, it was so badly dislocated that I thought it was fractured. So I wanted to make sure I'm not moving bone pieces into a socket. You know, and plus, too, if you're a loving, caring dad and you happen to have your own x-ray machine, well, why not? <laughs> Trust me, with two boys, I was really glad I had my own x-ray machine. <laughs> now, bursitis. Itis means inflammation. Bursa is the bursa sacs. Now, you, you figure ligaments hold bone to bone. Tendons connect that bone, that muscle to the bone. Now, all tendons cross joints. Now, now, you might think, well, you know, if you keep going like this, okay, like let's say, you know, God, I just flew in from Vegas and boy, are my arms tired? No. Okay, if you're moving like that, you got that tendon rubbing against the joint. So it might develop certain friction. And so there's a sac in there called a bursa sac filled with bursa fluid. I know, it's real complicated, okay? That's a super filtrate of blood, but it's there to cushion it. Now, if you don't have blood supply, now wh what would compromise the blood supply to a shoulder? Forward head carriage, okay. Gee, I've always had this bursitis. I'm taking those drugs to lower it. Dude, okay, let me explain where the blood supply and nerve supply come to the shoulder, okay? So bursitis means that there's no fluid in the sac and the tissue is rubbing together and it starts to inflame. So you got to put fluid in that area. Now the electron on bursa, this is on the elbow, it's usually from trauma. Could be direct trauma or could be because you're always leaning on it. But again, that's also going to have a double crush injury in the neck. Now, if it's swollen up like crazy, and again, let's just use common sense, which is incredibly rare now, is that mean that that's a problem with draining, not enough fluid, or the fluid's flowing in, but it ain't flowing out? Fluid's flowing in, ain't flowing out, honest to goodness. So this is what you'd use compression with, okay? You want to create a back pressure to blow out the valve so that the fluid inside of that electron bursa can start to function correctly. And then what do you have to do? You have to clean up the blood and restore the forward head carriage. You want to use heat, not ice. 
The worst thing that you can do is get cortisone in a joint. Cortisone destroys the joint cartilage, destroys the joint. It's the worst thing ever. I've never seen somebody with cortisone shots in a joint and the joint was um, beautiful. Okay, it literally does destroy it. It's, it's the dumbest thing ever. Putting ice on bursitis will help kind of, it'll feel good, but heat rushes it in. And I would do this to, to patients, like, you know, you know, they have bursitis here, and, you know, I've gotten three shots, and it hurts occasionally. Okay, so I'll go in, I'll ask, ask one of my team to go heat up a hot pack, and I'll say, just put it on your shoulder. Okay, but first, you know, do a move. Oh, yeah, it hurts right there. Okay, you put the hot pack on the shoulder, and, you know, I finish the exam, ask them a couple of questions and stuff. And after about a minute, I say, okay, take the hot pack. Now, how's your shoulder feel? It moves better. So when you put heat on it, okay, what's happening? You're increasing blood pressure. What, what does it turn? It turns red, right? That's because the brain senses that difference in temperature, increases the blood flow, so that you're increasing synovial fluid production, you're increasing bursa sac fluid production. Oh my God, it works so good. Okay, carpal tunnel. Uh, again, double crush injury beginning in the neck. Now, um, when you look at this, it's literally a tunnel. But let's look at the forearm. You've got muscles here called flexors. You've got muscles here called extensors. And that should be a five to four strength ratio. Should, should be almost the same strength. But we're not making fishing nets, and not everyone's doing chiropractic adjustments either. So we need to strengthen this because it's really a muscle imbalance. So if these muscles called extensors are weak, the flexors are really strong. It's also going to kick the, elect the ul ulnar over. Okay, so you can have ul ulnar or, or ulnar fossa problems, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. It's going to destabilize it. So just that muscle imbalance of the forearm is going to lead to a whole bunch of elbow um, difficulties. That's why typically the ulnar is gone medial, and we'll discuss that when we talk about extremity adjusting and also how to check it. But understand that it's, that it's that muscle imbalance. So how do you correct a muscle imbalance? Well, for one, knowing the carpal tunnel can cause incredible pain. I mean, you can, be, you can be sleeping like this and it'll burn, it'll wake you up. How do you make a muscle imbalance worse? You brace it. So anybody wearing a brace, okay, when I you know, would go to a store, if I saw someone wearing a brace, I'd run to my car and I'd say, look, I'm gonna show you how to do this, okay? You put electric tape around their wrist. And what you do is you put your thumb and pinky together and you can see it forms like a little tunnel in there. And you want to get the base of the meta metacarpals, okay, so you can still move your wrist. So it's up higher. And this will maintain the integrity and then you can do all your job and everything else. But while you're doing that rubber band exercise, flower bud to claw with the number 32 rubber band, you're going to strengthen the extensors. And that works really well. But what do you have to do? It, now, carpal tunnel syndrome, does that, that's a double crush injury beginning in the neck. So you got to fix the neck. And this will also help the shoulder. It'll help everything. So when we talk about joints, you have to restore the blood supply and nerve supply to it. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Okay, good. Now, when you're looking at this, it looks like the femur is going into a socket. Doesn't that look like that? Yeah? That's not what you're seeing. So what I tell my patients is I'm going to show you how to look through, um, look through the bone. So the femur goes in here in the socket, and what you're seeing is the top part is really big. The back part you're going to be looking through, and the front part you're looking through. So it's literally surrounded by bone. Now, I traced with a little blue line in there that's almost impossible to see the back half of the socket. Rarely, if ever, are you going to see, and this, this happens to be an 80-year-old patient, okay? And I, I chose him because he's a dancer, um, super, super active, and he has perfect joints. So anybody says that joints wear out, I'm going to just slap you, okay? And show you my 62-year-old joints work pretty damn good. <laughs> okay, here you go, 64 years old. Now, what's interesting when you're looking at the hips, you're always going to see a little bit of a distortion. I mean, maybe Carl Lewis, maybe super athletes have perfectly formed hips on both sides. Okay, this is not a perfectly formed hip. 
Now she's had joint pain or hip pain for three to four years. You're looking at 10 to 15 years of damage. So this socket is always being remodeled. But the hip is supplied by the nerves that come out of L1, L2 up here. Okay, right at the junction of the rib cage and low back. So when you look at her full x-ray, we're seeing multiple rotational malpositions. But it's not just the hip. If you're, your hip is bugging you, are you going to walk straight or are you going to walk crooked? Is that going to change the biomechanics of the feet, the knees, the pelvis? Pelvis is going to be unstable. You're talking the head's going to be off. You might develop shoulder issues. So when we talk about you have hip pain, okay, good. Let's look at the physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. You have bunion formation. How many bowel movements did he get? So you got to look at the whole thing. Here again, we're looking at an incredibly distorted hip. It's hard to see that. I mean, at home, when you're looking at the, at the MRI or the x-rays, it's going to be very clear. You're going to see a little thin line, and you're going to say, wow, that's not much of a difference. It doesn't take much of a difference. Okay, to regenerate the cartilage. You get 72-year-old gal compression a little bit better and all you need to do is do a little bit better and a lot of these you know hip pain for 20 years hip pain for four years where we're looking at more degeneration on the four-year one so we know that it was an adaptive physiological response this one's just criminal there's absolutely no distortion of the hip but she was talked into it by the surgeon so she got hip replacement i know now this is the exercise you need a weight big enough to open up that, that joint. And so this means you're standing on something and usually 10 to 20 pounds where you're dangling it. And you're going to see your, you, what people do when they have hip issues is they'll move the leg forward and then they'll go back like this. So they're, they're like those, those weird bird dolls, okay, with the fluid in it, okay? And, and this one, you want to keep stable. You want to wear a trochanter support, stable your pelvis, and just dangle it, just like it's a clock. And it's usually the heel is level with the toe, bam, and then the toe is level with the heel. So it's not a lot of movement, but it's a major pull on it, and that's going to create inflammation and allow the hip to regenerate. While you're rebuilding your hip, you've got to stabilize the pelvis. So this is going to be a trochanter support. If you can sit like a cowgirl backwards in a chair, a lot of people don't have the lateral uh, movement there, but the trochanter support is amazing. And then fixing the calf. Look at, our, look at our pelvis and knee support videos. Now, the knee. I know I'm running through all the joints in the body. I just want to give you like a real rough overview. Okay, the knee doesn't work like a hinge. It works like a screw. It moves twice as much on the medial or the inside as it does on the outside. That's why you got a C-shaped part like that right there is the, the tibia, what your femur is resting on. That's the part that I broke. I, I broke um, it on, actually on both my legs when I was hit by a car. But the C-shaped part means that it, it, it turns, okay, it turns twice as much. It pivots on the outside. Now, the key is, since it moves twice as much on the inside, there's a ligament that attaches to that meniscus. There's the anterior cruciate that attaches to it. So in injuries, you tear the medial collateral ligament, the meniscus, the medial meniscus, and the anterior cruciate. That's called a terrible triad of Donahue. I don't know who Donahue was, but it was certainly terrible. <laughs> and it's tough, okay? Meniscus does regenerate, okay? And what a lot of people, since MRIs distort the image or inflammation is, distorts the MRI image, I see a lot of people that say they have a totally torn um, ACL or anterior cruciate ligament, and it's not torn. You can tell from a drawer test. Um, it, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I tore the meniscus in my knee a few years ago. Yeah, it heals. It's living tissue. I know because I had four arthroscopic surgeries until I learned this. Okay, I learned that when you're walking and it's unstable and then you get another operation, they're not putting stuff in. They're taking stuff out. So there's more and more and more instability after each operation. And of course, they're saying, yeah, don't worry about it. A few more years, we'll just give you brand new knees. Okay, a foreign object. Okay, at the time, I was 35, and I'm going, hey, guys, you know, knees only last about 15 years, and I'm planning on living at least 100, which would be nice. Okay, 
yeah, no, meniscus regenerates. And I found out there's a way that you could regenerate it. But you have to look at the structures. In the back of the calf, the lower leg, there's a muscle called the soleus, and this is called the soleus pump. And this allows fluid to get into the knee. But also, if your feet aren't good, so we talk about foot health, intrinsic muscles of the foot, okay, all of those, if, you're, if you don't have good movement, your knees start to desiccate or dry up. So you have to make sure you have good foot biomechanics, good calf biomechanics, and remember how all the upper extremity, you had to have a good neck? You got to look for the pelvis and lumbar instability because that's going to make a big difference. Now, we check for um, quadricep tracking or patellar tracking. Quadriceps means four, so there's four muscles in the, in the thigh muscle. But we only check vastus uh, lateralis and vastus medialis because they're the ones that guide this patella inside. And if you have a long-term biomechanic problem or long-term disc injury, you're not going to be tracking real well. And this one is one of the greatest exercises. It's just a weight. You don't lift your leg up. You just dangle it. And this is also one of the exercises that when you're dangling your legs, you may find that it's hard to keep it even. And that also has to do with proprioception. Because if you're walking around with a bad limb, this is changing your gait, changing your brain on how you view mobility. So we tell people with long-term back injuries to high step because they're walking kind of crooked or to, to swing their legs and tap something. So this way you change that proprioceptive aspect. And this ankle weight thing is just brilliant. Uh, it was invented by a guy who fractured his right knee um, twice and his left knee once and he's gone through four operations. And he decided, because he was teaching human dissection at the time, that maybe it's living tissue and we create it. Okay, it was me. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, you know, thank you, God, but please give me an easier lesson next time. And, and you're going to see before and after, and there's not much of a change. It's a little bit of a change. And that's all you need, just a little bit. You're looking, I mean, to get symptom relief from joint issues, you're looking at very, very quickly. To regenerate the whole joint, you're looking at probably four or five years. But when you think about it, you're going to be four or five years older in four or five years. Wouldn't it be nice to be four or five years older with nice new knees? Blood is super important. Here's a guy, one of the worst things. He had a steel shaft going from one end to the other and bolts putting it in. But I just want to show you how blood, 18-year-old, 44-year-old, and 64-year-old, so three people in the family, and we're looking at the blood isn't healthy. We're, when you have chronic stress, your blood cells start to get sticky and they clump together like the 18-year-old. When you have extreme stress or nutrient deficiencies, they start to stack like the 44-year-old. And that, that is rouleau coin formation. The 64-year-old, it's hard to see from here, but you're going to see target cells which means mineral deficiency, so that means low stomach acid. Also, it could mean uh, liver dish issues, and the liver has to work harder under stress. Plus, the 64-year-old might have had her gallbladder removed, which means she has a problem with fat processing. Just know that this joint is hydraulic, and if the blood isn't healthy, you're not going to have good synovial fluid production. So you got to look at everything. Now, the therapies you can use, Moist heat is the best. The wetter, the better. The deeper, the penetration. That's what we used to tell everyone. Now, a hot water bottle, here's a shocker for you. Okay, this is like Trivia Pursuit, is actually considered dry heat. Okay, because it doesn't have that moisture. It has the moisture inside. So you got to wrap a hot water bottle, which I freaking love, okay, with a moist towel in order to get the moist heat. Dry heat, I don't recommend. Now, jacuzzi. And this is what we were talking about with one, one of the, when we were training yesterday. Okay, do you want to heat up the whole body to rush blood to the knee? Or do you want to put a hot pack on the knee? Hot pack, yeah. So the difference between a jacuzzi and, and a hot pack, okay, it's just way better. A jacuzzi will make you feel better, but you're not going to increase that body's energy to that affected joint as well. And we were, I was talking to one of our docs about overstimulating the nervous system, how you want to adjust only the areas 
that, that you want to create inflammation. Because if you create inflammation at every joint, because some people adjust all the back up, then adjust the back down, and then adjust every fingertip, and then adjust the toes, and then adjust the nose. You know, I mean, you're, the, the body has a limited ability to repair. You want to focus in on the most, most affected areas, then you're, you're going to have a more effective uh, result. Oh, uh, ice for acute injuries, electric stem, rarely, if ever, and ultrasound, rarely, if ever. Be super cautious with it. So it's basic. Your joints need blood supply and nerve supply. You don't do end range of motion with any joint. Um, rehab your cervical and thoracic area before you get any, any a semblance of where you're going to work on the upper extremities. You've got to correct the forward head carriage on every upper extremity. Uh, no ice on chronic joint injuries. It, it'll, it'll help with pain. I didn't go into medications here, okay? But understand, non anti-inflammatories, that's Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Uh, Tylenol has a similar effect, but it destroys the building block of cartilage. It's ridiculous. No doctor in the world should use it. And when we talk about science coming up, you got to know 50 years from now, people will go, my God, that was insane. How could you shoot someone with cortisone knowing it destroys the joint cartilage? It's mind blowing. So joints, we talk about the five keys to health, nerve supply, exercise, nutrition, sufficient rest and prayer and meditation. Now, now we're going to be delving in to information that the sensors um, do not think that you're able to handle. Okay, and this is the death of science and the religion of the science. Because if you've been upset when people say the science, okay, we're going to get into it. But but um, God bless you, YouTube and Facebook. Um, I, those get, people with Dr. B VIP, you aren't going to get an interruption. You're just going to keep seeing this. And I'll be back next week, and we're going to talk about some more cool stuff. Thank you.